All right, folks, it's Friday. Um, it's the last day of the conference. Don't be sad. We have the full day today. We have two days of sprints tomorrow and uh, um, lots of fun still uh, to be had. Um, I want to uh, introduce uh, three speakers for the first talk of Friday in uh, Brian. Um, the talk is titled Automatic Testing of Python Functions Based on Contracts. Very interesting subject. And we have here uh, Marco, Philip, and Laurent. Uh, I hope I pronounce your names uh, not too badly. Uh, we'll start with a uh, first, uh, with a video of, uh, uh, of Marco's presentation. Uh, he's here. He might be able to participate in the in the Q&A, but there are some technical issues. Uh, so we uh, we go for a pre-recorded video and then we will uh, go through um, Laurent and then Philip. I believe this is the order uh, for uh, uh, the live rest of the of the video, uh, of the presentation. So folks, you have 45 minutes. Um, it's a very interesting topic. I'm very excited to hear about it. And uh, I will uh, leave the floor to first the recorded video and then to the two of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Philip, very much for the introduction. Now let's see what the contracts are. Think for a second, what's a good, good function? Uh, you know, there are many qualities that the good function needs to fulfill. Um, efficiency, readability, maintainability, evolvability, and so on. Uh, but pretty high on the list is correctness. A uh, good function needs to be a correct one. Um, and it needs to do what it should. You know, if, if it doesn't do what it should, then it's not the correct, then it's a buggy function, and then probably also not a good function. Um, now, if you look at this example where we have a, a function that takes two arguments, we have an implementation that tells you how something works, but then you also have the specification of the behavior of a function uh, and that tells you what a function is doing. Now you need to specify this what if you want to check whether the how the implementation is correct. And our tools help you with these checks. Uh, now you can add proper naming. Instead of do something, we call our function, function approximates uh, SQRT. And we also name the arguments. There's a number and that there's precision. Uh, for many of you, this is probably already pretty clear what this function does. Now we can add the doc string. We can describe in human readable text what the function does. We can also specify the details. Here we say that the number and the precision and the result um, are related in terms of the absolute difference. And the problem with, with naming and doc strings is that they are human readable text. Uh, they cannot be automatically checked. So this documentation tends, tends to rot uh, in, in large systems. So you write a function, you implement it, then you go back to other tasks, then you come back to the function, uh, you change the implementation, but you often forget to change the documentation. For example, imagine here if you change the absolute difference to a relative one, um, then the readers would still think that the function is computing the absolute difference, but then your function does something else. Um, and the documentation is also ambiguous. This is one of the bigger problems. Uh, you know, here we did not specify whether the number is, uh, can be negative, can it be zero? What about the precision? You can add type annotations. Um, they already help a lot in Python. You can even add ranges to type up annotations. Um, the problem with type annotations is that they cannot capture relations. So though you could add the ranges, so for example, you could say numbers and non-negative, uh, you cannot say that the result is uh, related to the number and precision in terms of absolute difference, for example. Uh, now you can write unit tests. You can pick a couple of input points and then assert uh, that certain properties hold on the result. Now the problem with unit tests is that we 
often tend to forget about edge cases. We only pick a couple of obvious in input points. Uh, for example, I often forget or almost always forget to check for not a number. And in this case, uh, when you compute an approximation, uh, not a number can even result, for example, in an endless loop. Um, so alternative is to use property-based tests. Uh, instead of picking only a couple of input points, uh, you use a framework here, we use hypothesis. Um, you specify um, the, 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 whole, the whole input domain, and then you assert on the output properties, on the, on the properties of the output. Uh, maybe some of you saw also yesterday's talk by Zach Howard, uh, who showed the framework in more detail. Um, now, the problem with property-based tests, of course, is that there's some learning curve. You need to use a framework, so uh, you need to get familiar with it. And these strategies for defining the and, and generating the inputs uh, can become complex in certain cases. Now, another problem with property-based tests is that they only run in tests. They live in a separate model, separate from your code. Um, so you cannot check properties during staging or production. And in our experience, a lot of bugs actually happen in these environments. They, you know, you catch some of the bugs in your tests, uh, but oftentimes it's actually the real users uh, who will discover the bugs. Now you could write assertions. Uh, you write assertions at the beginning of the function and then you write assertions just before the end of the functions. Um, these first assertions are called open preconditions and the assertions just before you return are post conditions. Um, so the assertions are good. They can be checked in production and staging, but they're hard to process by analysis tools. Uh, you need to parse the whole body of the function and you need to do some inference on the code to check, to, to figure out uh, what your preconditions and post conditions are. Uh, you need to be careful about multiple returns. You need to repeat the assertions whenever you return from the function. And when you have inheritance and, and when you deal with instance methods, uh, that's when the assertions become really tedious because you have to be careful not to break uh, the risk of substitution principle. Now we present here our solution. Uh, it's based on contracts. Um, we use a, a contract library called iContract here, uh, which introduces decorators for the function. So we write contracts here. Uh, we actually rewrite the assertions. We turn them contracts. Um, there are preconditions. Here they are listed uh, with a require decorator. And we specify the post conditions here with ensure decorator. The preconditions needs to hold, uh, need to hold before the function executes. Um, these are the contracts that the caller of the function needs to fulfill. And the post conditions need, uh, the post conditions need to hold after the function finishes. Um, they need to be fulfilled by the function. So the nice thing about the contracts is that they live close to the code. So when you change the implementation, you can uh, uh, immediately also change the contracts. Um, they can be processed by analysis tools. Now we just need to parse the conditions. That's much easier than parsing the, the whole body. They can also run in staging and production. Uh, they give you much better documentation because you can use a, a Sphinx plugin, for example, and then all these conditions are also listed in your documentation. Uh, it's very practical when you, for example, uh, write a library. Uh, they're formal. So now if you don't have, the, the reader does not need to uh, think hard, you know, a positive number, does it include the zero or not? The contract is really clear, number greater or equal zero. Um, so we used iContract. Uh, the tools are based on iContract library. 
Uh, you can find the repository on GitHub. Uh, it provides a rich ecosystem. There's a plugin for Sphinx. There's a plugin also if you use fast APIs, you can include contracts in your end, uh, REST endpoints. Uh, we collected a list of recipes to help you start it. There's more to this ecosystem. Uh, but please note that there are also other libraries like deal and DP contracts and others. So I contract is not a single library, uh, a single contract library in Python. Um, please note at the end that you should combine all these approaches. They're all complementary. Uh, name your functions and your arguments properly. Use type annotations, write doc strings, write unit tests, uh, write property based tests. Also use contracts. You know, use whatever you can to make your functions uh, correct. And note that there is a no solution that fits them all. So for example, oftentimes a, sp a complete specification is not possible. So you can, for example, write a property-based test to cover some part of the input, um, but some part of the input also cannot be formally expressed. Uh, you can write maybe only some contracts, uh, so you don't have the 100% specification, but already these few contracts will reveal probably a lot of bugs in staging and production. So, for example, even if you write uh, an input must be positive, uh, whenever you pass in a negative input, you will reveal a bug. And oftentimes there, there are bugs in the color code as well. Uh, so do make sure that you also, you know, figure out something in the staging and production. And then to increase the coverage, write unit tests for all those cases where you cannot formally uh, express them and specify them. Thank you very much. And now Laureen will present uh, eye contract hypothesis, a tool that infers the generative hypothesis strategies based on the contracts. Laureen, the stage is all yours. All right, thank you very much, Marco. Um, so as Marco says, uh, I'm Lavin, and I'm going to present to you the first of two tools called eye contract hypothesis. Um, so eye contract hypothesis is an integration of eye contract with hypothesis, basically combining design com the design by contract ID from eye contract with property based testing in hypothesis. So for those who don't know hypothesis, here uh, is hypo hypothesis in a nutshell, or all you need to know for this presentation. Um, Hypothesis is a property-based testing library in Python um, where you can write parameterized tests and define data generators uh, for it called strategies in, uh, in Hypothesis, which uh, gives you an easy way of testing your, uh, your functions against a lot of random inputs. Um, so that's all you need to know for now. Um, there's, of course, of course, much more on Hypothesis, um, but then you uh, should attend one of Zach's talks or just go to the website. Why should you use something like eye contract, uh, eye contract hypothesis? It's because property-based testing is hard and tedious. Hypothesis already does a great job of um, making it way more easier uh, to write test, uh, test your codes. Um, and eye contract hypothesis will combine the power of hypothesis with the uh, power of eye contracts, um, so with integrating contracts and hypothesis. So you can use eye hypothesis to generate property-based tests efficiently and automatically. Um, and although it does already a great job of assuring you uh, of some properties uh, in your code, it does not cover all situations. So uh, mind that you still need extra tests um, for your code. What does eye contract hypothesis exactly do? So you have your preconditions in eye contract. Um, you see them here on your left. An eye contract hypothesis will match common code patterns to hypothesis strategies. For example, um, if you have bounds on an integer, then it matches those to an integer strategy um, with a minimum and maximum value. Um, or you can also um, describe patterns on strings, um, argument strings. Um, so we have some common code patterns that we can match, but there are still, of course, preconditions that cannot be matched. And in this case, we add them as filters. Um, so here you can see, for example, um, a filter where you uh, filter out all integers modulo two, 
have to be zero, so even numbers. Um, so you have to pay attention if you have a lot of filters in your strategies or you have restrictive filters because the, they may reject too much data and at the end you will end up with a test that, that's not worth much because you don't have any data to uh, test against. So now I will give a short demo of what you can do with eye contract hypothesis. Um, there are multiple ways in which you can use um, eye contract hypothesis. And the first way is by using it as a library into your Python code. So we start here from the function that Marcus has shown previously, um, a portion of square root with your preconditions and your postconditions. Um, and we will start with just writing a simple test in a hypothesis without taking into account any of, um, of the preconditions. So it takes the same uh, arguments as our original function, and number and precision. Um, and now we can just call our function approximate square root because we have our post condition and also an assert statement that will tell us if our test fails. Um, now we add the given decorator. Here we specify the uh, strategies in hypothesis. So yeah, we just want a bunch of floats, both for number and precision. Um, and with these three of lines, we have our test case and we can just run the test case and we immediately see the results um, if anything breaks our code. Now, of course, we haven't taken into account the pre uh, preconditions. Um, in one of the preconditions, we said we want a precision that's strictly greater than zero um, because, of, yeah, of course, a perfect um, approximation um, cannot be calculated. Um, so next, we're trying to make sure that all the inputs um, do satisfy our preconditions. The first way is a um, simple way and um, is by making sure that it just rejects all the inputs that doesn't uh, satisfy our preconditions. So it's called assume preconditions. It's basically a function um, that you can generate at a contract hypothesis. Um, and what it will do, it will just reject all the inputs that do not satisfy our preconditions and then we get already a better result. Uh, as you can see, our function apparently doesn't handle big numbers very well. Um, but it's, although it's already an all right solution, um, it's still very inefficient. Um, and we still need some boilerplate code to uh, to write the test case. Um, but I think hypothesis does allow us to make it way more easier by just having a single line of code. Um, where it will use a more efficient way of testing it um, by um, inferring a strategy. So test with inferred strategy, we'll infer the strategy for approximate square roots, and then test, uh, test the function against uh, the input. So as you can see here, we already have a different output, um, in the, the falsifying example, and that's because, of course, under the hood, it's different from the previous uh, solution. Um, So now we have uh, tested our code uh, in first strategy, but of course, most of the time we will want to know what was the strategy that was used. So we can also um, print the strategy that was used for um, to test the function. Um, so here you can see the two uh, arguments, number and position with our strategy. So this is the first way you can use it as a library in, uh, I have, uh, in Python. The next way is a comment line tool. So you can just install Pi a contract hypothesis. Um, and then the first way you can use this tool is to test your code uh, directly. So you have the test function and then you specify the file you want to test. Here is zero python.py, which um, includes the same uh, function as before. And as you can see, we get the same, uh, same output as before as well. So it's just going to test your code against the inferred strategies. Um, and then you can get an overview of what input uh, breaks your code. Also via the comment line, you can uh, inspect which strategy was used. Um, here it tells you the strategy and you can also see where it was used for which function. The next functionality of uh, iconic hypothesis in the comment line is the ghost writer. It's uh, very similar to hypothesis ghost writer. Um, and what it does is it writes entire uh, test suites for you. Um, so it's like basically the easiest way um, to write tests. Um, it manage, manages the imports and then you get a class 
uh, a unit, uh, unit test, test case with here the test for your uh, for your function. So if you have multiple functions in your file, I would also get multiple uh, test cases. There are some flags you can pass uh, to the Ghostwriter. Um, one, the first one is if you want to see which strategies, uh, strategies that were used. Um, so you have explicit flags, and now you get get some uh, more verbose overview and more verbose test case. Um, and if you want, you can uh, modify it to your needs. Um, if you just want to test case without all the stuff around it, then you have the bare flags. Um, so that was the comment line, the second way. Uh, and the third and final way, how you can use a contract hypothesis um, is in your IDE. Um, so there already exists uh, plugins for um, the PyCharm IDE, for Visual Studio Code, and for Vim. Um, and it's very easy to use. You just uh, I will show you here how um, I use it in PyCharm. Uh, so you can just install it in PyCharm, go to the plugins, uh, look for iContract Hypothesis PyCharm. Um, and what you get then is, so we have the same function as before, just right click um, on your function and here you get an overview of what's uh, possible. So it's the same functionality as before, but now uh, very accessible into uh, in PyCharm. So the first way is yeah, just test your function. You, when you're developing, you can quickly just run uh, your test and see what's going wrong. Uh, the next way is to see what strategy corresponds to your function. The third way is to use a ghost writer. So um, you have the test uh, case, a test suite um, in your prompt. And then um, the last option is to directly write your uh, test suite to a file. And then you have an external test suite that you can modify that you can use. Um, so it's this is one of the easiest way to quickly test your code with iContract Hypothesis. So that's how you can use iContract Hypothesis. And uh, to end my part, um, just a look into the future uh, of iContract Hypothesis of, or what we want to, what we envision as a future of iContract Hypothesis. So right now, um, if you have a function where you have multiple variables um, and define relations between them, then you get a piece of code that's not very readable and not efficient. So yeah, you need to use fixed dictionaries that you filter um, and just put a whole condition, a whole precondition into a filter. Um, and this will often lead to um, very inefficient strategies that are not very readable. So what we would like to end up with are um, composite strategies. Um, this is a functionality in, in um, hypothesis where you can define your um, strategies procedure, uh, procedurally. So it um, makes it possible to define relations between multivariable conditions. Um, it's more efficient because you often don't need a, uh, a filter. And it also makes it more readable. Um, here you can quickly see you have the two input arguments and you can just read it and you know and, uh, try, uh, immediately what is going on. So that was iContract Hypothesis. Um, and then I will now give the stage to Philip, uh, who will introduce his tool, Crosshair. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Lauren uh, and Marco. Um, so uh, I am I'm actually cover three topics. Uh, the first is Crosshair, which is a tool that's quite similar to iContract Hypothesis. Uh, I will also talk a little bit about a corpus that we've been developing for contract, uh, and I'll sort of field Q&A. Uh, so firstly, Crosshair, uh, uh, I am the, the primary maintainer for Crosshair, and Crosshair is a tool to check contracts, uh, but it works a little bit differently than I contract hypothesis. Uh, it works with symbolic execution. So hypothesis is a tool uh, that will apply sort of uh, random heuristic inputs, uh, but Crosshair attempts to verify your contract uh, in a more formal way. Uh, so we use a theorem prover to reason about all possible values uh, when we run your code. Uh, to be a little bit more specific, we, we find one concrete path through your code and reason about all values along that path, and then we'll try other paths. So it's concrete paths, but with symbolic values. I won't go into too much about how symbolic execution works. If you don't 
already know much about it, that's fine. Uh, if you'd like to learn more, uh, you can, uh, there's, some, there's some links and information about how Crosshair works uh, in more detail at the website. Um, but today, I am going to mostly just get into the demo. I'm going to attempt a completely live demo for us today. Uh, and so I'm going to describe a potential problem. And so in this problem, we are uh, implementing a online shopping system. Uh, and so the objective is to compute a total price for your online shopping order. Uh, and, and the inputs to such a function are a set of items that the user is buying. Uh, and so this is a list of line items. The line items each have an, an item ID for the item that you're purchasing and the quantity. In order to compute a total, we'll also need prices for all of those items. So uh, this, this is a dictionary that maps a string, which is intended to be the item ID of the line item, uh, into a float price. Of course, don't use floats in, for, for monetary units, but uh, in this example, we'll, we'll do this. Um, uh, and then we, we will return a, a total. So the implementation for this function is fairly straightforward. Uh, we start with an empty total, we loop over the line items, uh, we uh, add uh, the price for each item and multiply by the quantity, and then return the total. Now, one thing we would like to ensure that this uh, that happens for our online system is that nobody should be able to check out uh, with a, a total of, of zero. Now, uh, uh, you can already imagine many ways in which you can pass inputs that, that would not meet this. Uh, and we could start implementing uh, preconditions with via the required decorator to, to ensure these. But one of the nice things about tooling and uh, like Crosshair and, and Hypothesis is that we can use these tools to um, just sort of tell us what those preconditions are. Uh, so, uh, there is a, I'm using PyCharm, there's a PyCharm plugin for Crosshair. Uh, and so we can uh, sort of continuously run Crosshair with this watch command. Uh, and so this will sit here and think about the function and try to find inputs that will invalidate the, uh, the post condition. Uh, so uh, uh, we already have one here. And so we're going to go through these one by one and start adding preconditions to see if we can we can make crosshair happy. Uh, so one thing it's noticed is that there's a key error. So here are item IDs, empty strings, a little weird empty uh, uh, string, but uh, oops. Okay, uh, this does does update in live. So we, we maybe have a, maybe we'll deal with this one first. One is that prices dictionary has a, has a zero price for this item ID. Uh, and so, uh, so one thing we should ensure that is that prices, uh, uh, always has a uh, always has positive prices. Uh, if you're like me, you write your list comprehensions in reverse. Uh, so for all of the prices and values, we want to ensure that the price is greater than zero. Oops. There we go. Uh, great. So we got that one. Uh, but uh, here we see items could be empty. Uh, so we should also require that uh, the items, the length of those things, should be greater than zero. Let's see if that makes us happy. Not quite. Uh, okay, here we don't have a false. Oops. Uh, okay, here's a false. Uh, and in this case, we have a positive price. Uh, we have item IDs that match, but the quantities are zero. So quantities should should be greater than zero. Again, we'll need an I for I and items. Uh, what do we need to ensure? Well, uh, I dot item ID should be in the prices dictionary. Oops, Oops I forgot to add prices to my inputs to the precondition. And maybe we did it. So oh, not quite. Let's see. Uh, item ID, quantity, prices zero. Ah, uh, prices five. 
Oh, oh, the quantities are are zero. So so we need we need positive quantities. I think now we've gotten it. Uh, so uh, one thing about this example is we didn't actually find any problem with compute total. So we did a, we did a whole lot of work, but we didn't find any bugs. Uh, and and this is sort of a different way of thinking about contracts and useful in a in a different way as well. So uh, one of the things this does for you is it makes a lot of your assumptions uh, sort of explicit. And by adding all of these contracts to this function, all of the functions that call it will have to meet these requirements. And that in turn may require more preconditions on those functions. And so these, these conditions spread throughout your system in much the same way that, uh, say, when you change the type of an argument, you have to change it in a bunch of other places. Uh, so, so that may seem like work, uh, but it's actually fairly important in making a lot of important things explicit. So uh, uh, an example here, like just to go through these one by one, uh, we would like to ensure that when you change the quantity of a line item to zero, that we remove it from the from the cart. Uh, we would like to ensure that you can't add something to your cart for which we don't have a price. Uh, we should also make sure that you cannot get to the checkout part of the system uh, if you don't have any any items in your cart. And finally, if you're parsing some third party price feed, you should validate that all of the prices are greater than zero. And so all of these conditions are um, uh, propagate these requirements throughout your system. This is this is really sort of uh, a beautiful thing about using contracts generally. Uh, okay, so that is uh, that is this example. I'm going to stop uh, crosshair, uh, and I'm briefly going to show also um, the approximate square root function that we uh, that we've been taught using uh, elsewhere, and so we can watch this. This guy instead. Uh, I just pulled uh, Newton's method for approximating square roots, and and you can see here also uh, we find a counterexample, and that's because the function I uh, I pulled uses less than or equal to, whereas our our condition wanted a less than position. So we can uh, we can just correct that in our in our implementation, and and Crosshair gets happy. Uh, okay, so let's stop that. And let me flip back to the presentation. Uh, I do want to talk a, a little bit about the limitations of Crosshair. Uh, so the first is that Crosshair is, is probably in a, in a beta quality uh, uh, situation. Uh, it does not uh, symbolically model everything in CPython. Basically, what's required in order to make Crosshair work is that we have to logic sort of implement in, in a formal logic way everything that's implemented in C. And so we have a lot of it, but it's not complete. And so there's a lot of parts of Python where uh, Crosshair is not that effective simply because we haven't implemented it. Uh, also, because of the way it works with the solver, uh, as code complexity increases, it may increasingly have trouble finding uh, or, or, or solving the problems that it needs to solve. Uh, and then finally, uh, there are some limitations that are, are built into the uh, solvers that we use. Uh, we use a thing called SMT solvers, and, uh, and there are certain problems that, that it doesn't handle very well. Uh, so nonlinear arithmetic in general is, is undecidable. Uh, and so to make that concrete, uh, perhaps an easy example that Crosshair cannot find a counterexample for is this one where we say powers of two, uh, powers of two should all be small. But of course, we all know many powers of two are very big. It's very easy to find a, a big power of two. Uh, you can put, put even about any value in here for x and, and non-trivial positive value, and you get a very big result. But, but Crosshair doesn't tell you this. Um, uh, I contract hypothesis would, for example, because it's, you just have to try some values, and it's easy to find one. Uh, so those are some of the limitations of the system. I want to talk about some related tools. Uh, so uh, right down the center, column here, we have uh, some other tools that work very similar to Crosshair. Uh, many of these are based on research papers and, and, and such. Uh, I, I believe Crosshair is the most uh, feature complete in terms of implementing uh, as much of Python as possible. 
uh, but but you may also be interested in these tools. They're more toolkit like, and Crosshair is a little bit more product like. So depending on what you're looking for, some of those other projects may be the right uh, the right thing to look for. Uh, on the left side, uh, we have some other tools that just uh, other ways of analyzing Python programs that don't use symbolic execution hypothesis. Uh, fuzz testing is a, a huge uh, active area right now where uh, mostly security-based stuff, but a lot of fuzz testing can those tactics can be used to uh, demonstrate correctness as well. Uh, on the right side, we have some symbolic execution tools which are not analyzing Python. Uh, Anger and Kli are examples of this. Uh, it can be a little confusing because Anger is itself implemented in Python, but it analyzes binary. So both of these tools analyze uh, machine code uh, and sort of or manage, analyzes code uh, that's at the machine code level uh, rather than at the Python code level. So Crosshair is, is looking at your Python code and understands Python. Uh, so that's that's some of the difference with those tools. Uh, okay, so that's Crosshair. Uh, I'm going to spend a little time talking about uh, our Python by contract corpus now. Uh, so the Python by contract corpus is a set of problems, solutions, and contracts. Uh, and and right now we have uh, the 2020 Advent of Code problems as well as the fall 2019 exercises from Introduction to Programming at ETH Cert. Uh, both contain good and buggy implementations. Uh, so why would we do this? Well, uh, uh, corpus can be used to benchmark and compare contract analysis tools, such as I contract hypothesis and crosshair. Uh, and so, so that's why we've built it. Uh, there are also good examples for education. So uh, if you're if you're interested in contracts and want, want to see some examples, uh, you can you can use this for it. Um, we also strongly welcome contributions because. Uh, uh, more code means that we can do more testing of our tools and improve them. Uh, so, uh, so those are welcome, and you can find instructions at this link. Uh, by the way, the slide deck is linked in the talk notes on in the online system. Uh, okay, and so that's it for my sections, and now we'll move on to some Q and A. I think perhaps all three of us are are here online. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it was a, a fantastic, uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed it. It's a hot topic, and uh, uh, it's also reflected in the chat. I see uh, lots of questions flying by. Um, so I'll uh, I'll do my best and uh, uh, and ask you the uh, most upvoted questions or the one I guess the highest number of you know thumbs up little hearts that kind of stuff and uh we'll start with one immediately i'll put it here at the bottom of the screen i'll try to summarize it uh so people are asking um you know um this is fantastic but can we have an uh, or is there a, an easy switch right when you put your code into production uh to maybe disable some of this uh, uh some of these checks or all of them entirely. Uh, so uh, Marco is actually the author of the iContract library. There is a way to disable it. I don't know if he wants to uh, uh, talk in more detail about that or whether you whether your connection is good enough, Marco. Yeah, l let's try. If it breaks down, you can talk at the end. Um, so yeah, there is a switch in the decorator. You can, um, at, the, at the load time of the module, you can turn off some of the contracts or all of them or whatever way you configure it. So you can be really fine grained. You can control that at a very high, fine grained level. Uh, sometimes at load time, you can also use implications like an, an or, not and or, uh, if you want to have that at runtime as well. So there, there are ways. They're also listed in recipes on, on iContract repository. Cool, excellent. Um, another question related to um, maybe some of this uh, this very topic, I guess, uh, somehow, and I will put it here. Let's see. So a lot of us are using a lot of other libraries that we don't write ourselves and obviously don't have contracts. So, uh, you know, what about those? Can you easily, uh, I don't know, maybe add contracts outside of these libraries, uh, you know, do you have any, any comment on that? I 
I don't, I don't know whether Marco has any thoughts about this, uh, but I, I don't know of a way to do this. So you can, of course, wrap, uh, wrap the functions that you need with your own functions and apply contracts to those. Um, uh, but I'm not aware of a way in the iContract to just apply. Uh, uh, well, is that true? Uh, you could you could do some fancy Python things where you just uh, sort of monkey patch the functions with ones that are annotated. Um, so so at least that might be possible. I don't know if we'd recommend it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I, I was thinking more or less along the same lines. Anybody else wants to mention uh, anything on this topic? Cool. Another question uh, that flew by is what about performance implications? I mean, I mean, I imagine all these checks have some performance hit. Do you have uh, a little bit of an idea of, you know, how much we can expect? Uh, so, so as Marco said, there's uh, so on, on eye contract. Go ahead, Marco. So, sorry, guys. So on on the on the repository, we also present benchmarks. Um, so there are basically no um, there's no efficiency penalty if you turn the contracts off. Uh, of course, you need to pay for what you're using. So if, if you turn the contracts on, they will run as fast as they run in, in Python code. And then there's some marginal overhead due to decoration. So you have this, but it's also due to how the Python works. Um, so assertions are the fastest way if you, if you just want to use assertions. Uh, but then you pay some marginal effort for the, for the decoration, and that's it. Um, we, we present benchmarks on the repository so people can check them out. Um, in most practical settings, um, like in all the production systems I worked with, for example, uh, we didn't really observe any significant uh, overhead so that we had to turn the contracts off. We usually turn off the post conditions, the ensure decorators, but we leave the preconditions on to catch the bugs in the core code. Fantastic. Anybody else wants to comment on this? If not, uh, we have lots of questions. We don't have a huge amount of time, but some of the questions are really, actually all of the questions are fantastic. Uh, I'll, I'll show another one uh, here with a little sad face. <laughs> what about Python 2? Some of us uh, have uh, large code bases still written in Python 2 and the porting, as you know, takes time and effort. Uh, any 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 love for Python two or should we really go to Python three? Yeah, I I think all tools need at least Python three point six even, or yeah, or I think I contract might work with three point five, but yeah, I th I think it's three point six at the moment for all the tools. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Cool. Uh, a couple of more questions. Um, this one is, is quite uh, interesting. Uh, do you folks have any uh, thought of, uh, about this uh, new PEP, relatively new PEP uh, 647 about type guards uh, for Python 3.10? I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah, so, so the type guards, um... If, if I remember correctly, it's that you can add value ranges on the on the variables, for example, on, on input arguments, right? Um, I hope I'm not mixing it up now. Um, they are okay for, for single arguments, but they cannot model the relations. So, for example, if you take the, the approximate square root example, there you cannot say that the result is the absolute difference from the inputs, right? The input squared is the result up to the precision in absolute terms and not in relative, et cetera. So it, I think they are serving like different use cases. The type cards are more looking at the single arguments, whereas contracts are really uh, good when you have relations in the arguments or even relations to the external code. So for example, if you have a singleton somewhere, et cetera. Um, 
I would say the, the the contracts are just more powerful. So there was there was also discussion in Python ideas mail list introduce contracts in Python natively, but uh, not fruitful yet. Uh, yeah, I, I had to refresh my memory on this PEP, uh, but uh, I'm fairly certain that this one uh, it helps you narrow types. Uh, and so uh, the, the expressiveness of the typing system isn't changing. Uh, it, it helps you uh, uh, sort of like uh, say when when certain functions are, are are producing things of certain types, you can you can do that more effectively. But it's not changing the expressivity of the type system itself. Uh, whereas uh, in terms of contracts, we are saying you you can say arbitrary things about your data, which is uh, I believe is not true for that type. Excellent, Fan fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we are just uh, at the break, so um, there were a couple of more questions. Um, I will copy them uh, into the breakout room uh, for Brian. So if you folks are hanging out uh, a little bit longer, you can uh, keep the discussion going into breakout um, Brian. And uh, uh, thank you again for the talk. It was a fantastic talk, very, very interesting. And uh, uh, lots of people enjoyed it, lots of discussions, very cool stuff. Thank you for taking the time.